and the police have used uh, unnecessary and excessive force against peaceful protesters. And now hundreds of people are still in hospitals and they have received very serious injuries. And even more, uh, several people died as a result of the use of excessive force. But uh, unfortunately, no criminal cases were initiated. Hello and welcome to The Human Rights Defender, a podcast series in which we'll explore the work and lives of brave individuals standing up for our human rights. My name's Philip Merrill. I'm a communications officer at Civil Rights Defenders, an international human rights organization. And in this opening season, we'll be taking a closer look at the Western Balkans and Turkey, regions in which democracy and the rule of law have come under growing strain in recent years. As we've just heard in the intro, our focus in season one is very much on the Western Balkans and Turkey. However, in this special edition, we felt compelled to go a little north and touch upon the situation in Belarus. You've all seen the headlines, the mass pro-democracy protests taking place each Sunday, which are typically followed by violent crackdowns. With our guests from Minsk, we'll take a closer look at the grave human rights violations by President Lukashenko's regime, the role of Belarus's civil society over the years, as well as the ways in which the international community and organisations can help support their struggle. And for this purpose, I'd like to bring in our programme officer for Eurasia, uh, Alexander Sjordin. Alex, thanks for giving me a hand here. Before we start, could you give us a bit of context about why this pro-democracy movement in Belarus is so momentous? Hey, yes. First of all, it's important to remember that Belarusians have lived in an authoritarian state for the past 25 years, with severe limitation of freedom of expression, association and assembly. Uh, Therefore, the massive peaceful uprising we have witnessed in recent weeks is even more impressive, considering the risks that protesters take. The violent repression uh, we've seen was unfortunately to be expected, But despite that, people did not back down and even found more courage and determination to protest. In Belarus, of course, the situation is particularly difficult for those defending civic and political rights, such as independent NGOs and human rights defenders. Uh, They are repeatedly targeted by the authorities that really have designed a system where it is difficult to operate legally. I see. So we're very fortunate and honoured to be joined by HRD from Belarus. It's Victoria Fedorova, the chairwoman of the legal initiative, a Minsk-based NGO. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. How did we get here? What are some of the factors that led to this deep-rooted mistrust and anger across Belarus society? Perhaps I should start with the, the events of the beginning of the year. And even from December 2019, when the government of Belarus uh, has negotiations with Russia on possible integration. And at the same time, the citizens didn't know what exactly they were talking about. And uh, the protests were not as massive as they are now, but they were. And there were waves of repressions, uh, detentions and arrests. Then in the spring, a new threat emerged. Uh, I'm talking about COVID pandemic. And like most countries around the world, Belarus uh, was opted not to resort to a lockdown. And Lukashenko dismissed the pandemic and made fun of the victims. It was um, a very bad situation because uh, people uh, are dying, but he just made jokes. It it was impossible. And uh, Belarus was uh, the only country in Europe to commemorate the anniversary of the end of the Second World War with a full military parade. Not, uh, notwithstanding warnings from the World Health Organization and the health risks due to coronavirus pandemic. And at the same time, the doctors did not have basic personal protective equipment and the state did nothing to solve the situation. And the next step uh, was uh, these um, uh, repressions against potential presidential ca- candidates. It all started with Sergei Tikhanovsky, uh, who is a popular blogger. He made uh, reports about the life of people in regional cities And after he announced his desire to participate in the elections, he was arrested and couldn't uh, apply to participate. Instead, uh, his wife, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, registered and uh, thousands of people stood in line to leave signature in her support. 
And sometime later, the second potential candidate, Viktor Babarika, was detained. Viktor uh, was the head of the bank and was a well-known person who did a lot for Belarusian culture. He had a great team uh, that collected about half a million signatures in support of him. And after his arrest in violation of the presumption of innocence, the Central Election Commission didn't re- register him. Also, uh, the next candidate, Valery Tsipkala, who previously worked in the state system and was uh, the founder of the high-tech park, wasn't registered. And people realized that their votes uh, had been stolen. Protest actions began. Thousands of people took to the streets to express uh, their disagreement with what was happening. And after the teams of unregistered candidates, Babarika and Tsipkala, united uh, with Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, the protest got a fresh start. In general, it's not typical for uh, our Belarusian opposition to unite. But this time, everything happened differently. Uh, The united team met with voters in Minsk and the regions and gathered tens of thousands of people. And uh, that is why uh, the official results of the elections were not accepted by the citizens. The absence of international observers, uh, the detention of uh, local observers and numerous facts of election violations, all this only intensified the protests. And, uh, of course, the final point of no return was uh, the violence all around Belarus, which took place on August 9, uh, 10 and 11. There was another mass rally last Sunday, after which Maria Kolesnikova, a key opposition figure, was reportedly snatched and taken away by authorities. Uh, What are some of the latest developments regarding the detainment of political activists, peaceful protesters and journalists across the country? More than 600 uh, peaceful protesters were detained on Sunday, 6 September. It can be stated that the level of repression remains high. Most of the cases of detention were were very brutal with uh, the use of physical force and beatings. And law enforcement officers were with closed faces. Many of them were in civilian clothes, so it's difficult to identify them. On Monday, Maria Kolesnikova, a board member of the Coordination Council, was detained right uh, in the center of Minsk. For more than a day, her fate was unknown. At the same time, two more members of the Coordination Council were detained. On Tuesday, it became known that they were forcibly taken from Belarus to Ukraine. While, uh, according to media reports, Maria Kolesnikova didn't get to Ukraine since she destroyed her passport on neutral territory between the states. Now she is detained uh, and being held in Belarus, but we don't know where exactly. And also the week uh, began with arrests and searches of environmental activists and other NGOs uh, representatives. What would you say have been the main achievements or successes of the movement so far? I believe that uh, the main achievement uh, is that today society is solidary and united as never before. At the moment, there is no opposition in Belarus. We are the majority. The majority which is opposed by the person holding the office of the president who actually illegally retains power. And every Sunday, more and more people take to the street in Minsk and regions. Now the protest has no leader. The protest is completely decentralized. And it seems to me that this is uh, the reason of success. Because uh, people do not have confidence in the traditional leaders. Uh, The first step towards the formation of such an active civil society was the reaction uh, to the state's attitude toward the COVID pandemic, While Lukashenko called the pandemic psychosis, it was the civil society that raised money to provide doctors with personal protective equipment. And now the same same, uh, civil society uh, has raised millions of dollars to help victims of repression, victims of torture, as well as to help the security forces who refuse to carry out criminal orders. You mentioned the leaderless character of these protests. Is this a strength? And how do you go about ensuring that you communicate and that you organize logistically as one with a common goal? 
Well, people know that uh, every Sunday uh, we, we just go to the streets and uh, every Saturday, for example, it's a traditional um, uh, meeting for women. Uh, it's kind of uh, tradition every Saturday. And uh, we, we know about these actions uh, via Telegram channels which are very popular in Belarus. And, uh, well, when we uh, had this uh, total uh, shutdown of Internet, uh, the Telegram channels uh, were the only source of information. And uh, you know, we can deal with it. So I don't believe that we need uh, some kind of a person who will lead us. Because uh, as our practice show, Belarusian practice show, every person could be detained. For example, today, the board member of uh, Coordination uh, Council, Maria Kolesnikova, uh, she was detained and we don't know where is she now. And uh, another members of Coordination Council in the same situation. Let's backtrack a bit. How would you describe the environment for human rights defenders and independent journalists throughout Lukashenko's 26-year regime? As for the activities of human rights organizations, in principle, for many years, we have been working in an extremely repressive field. Our opportunity to work in the legal field are very limited. For example, we cannot visit prisons and pre-trial detention centers and monitor the human rights there. And, uh, of course, uh, independent journalists... um, under the pressure every every time. And uh, in the August, uh, journalists covering the demonstrations have been harassed and in some cases attacked and uh, had the equipment destroyed or confiscate. And we have a number of about uh, 150 journalists uh, uh, who were detained in August. Do you feel this repression has evolved since the protests began? Now we see that uh, Belarusian authorities are stepping up with uh, withdrawal of press accreditations for journalists covering the country's news for foreign media, including foreign media that works in Belarus, um, like uh, Radio Svoboda. It's very popular media, but but, um, the state considers it like foreign media. And in principle, it can be stated that the situation for human rights defenders and for journalists has significantly worsened. And even considering that the situation was also difficult before the elections. And uh, of course, uh, after the elections, we as human rights defenders faced an unprecedented situation and the level of repression. Since Sunday, the election day, uh, there were total internet shutdowns as well as blocking of many social media platforms, NGOs, and uh, news websites. We still know that about uh, 70 or more websites uh, are blocked uh, in Belarus. And uh, following the announcement of results uh, from Sunday elections, peaceful protesters uh, erupted through Belarus, uh, but uh, more than 7,000 people were detained in the three days including bystanders, and uh, it was in clear violation of international human rights. And uh, we know uh, that detained people are held in overcrowd cells, uh, for example, in cell for uh, six people, about 50 people uh, were kept, and uh, people didn't get food and water. Police officers humiliated people and tortured them during detention. So the situation with human rights and the level of repression now is uh, unprecedented. Alex, back over to you. How does this environment which Victoria mentions complicate working with, reaching out to, even simply identifying partners in Belarus? A key aspect in, uh, in this respect concerns the registration of NGOs, which is an extremely burdensome process. Those working on what the authorities view as sensitive topics face a lot of difficulties to register. Uh, The process is obviously flawed and the authorities come up with uh, all kinds of excuses not to register NGOs. Some of them have have tried repeatedly year after year to register unsuccessfully. So this is important because for many years actually activities of unregistered organizations were a criminal offense which could lead to imprisonment and it 
did actually lead to several cases of NGOs leaders being imprisoned for that. It was uh, then decriminalized a couple of years ago, but violating such law can still lead to administrative administri liability and be punished with fines. The authorities also can uh, put pressure on NGOs by threatening sanctions or even the registration. So this whole issue of uh, uh, registration works as a sword of Damocles uh, hanging over independent NGOs. So back on the ground, Victoria, what are some of the implications of this? Of course, every organization, every civil society organization uh, members, sometimes uh, they are intimidated by uh, some kind of security forces. Uh, KGB, we still have this uh, state uh, body, KGB, which can just intimidate people uh, to stop uh, their activities in any, any field. I, I, I don't speak only about civil and political rights, but also about women's rights and uh, ecological issues and so on. Uh, so what sort of cases uh, do you look at at the Legal Initiative and what would you say have been your key achievements, particularly relating to human rights over the years? Legal Initiative uh, was founded uh, more than uh, 20 years ago and our mission is uh, strengthening democracy with the rule of law and respect for human rights. Our main activities are human rights education, uh, help to victims of human rights violation, improvement of legislation and raising the awareness of the international community regarding the situation in Belarus. And speaking about our, our achievements, uh, first of all, this is uh, the training of a new generation of human rights defenders who are actively involved in the work of organizations. Uh, since uh, 2010, uh, we have been conducting an annual educational course on human rights for young people. And most of our graduates uh, remain in the human rights sector, getting involved in the work of organizations, uh, volunteering or creating their own initiatives. And uh, the second important part of our work is um, work with uh, the prohibition of torture. We coordinated the preparation of uh, two coalition uh, uh, shadow reports to committee against torture. And at the national level since 2010, uh, our organization uh, has been dealing with the situation with the condition of detention in the isolation center for offenders in Minsk. It was uh, very uh, hard work, uh, numerous complaints about inhuman conditions, court cases, and even uh, complaints with the UN Human Rights Committee. And uh, in 2018, uh, the Human Rights Committee adopted views on the first case. It was uh, Yegor Babrov uh, against Belarus case. Uh, the complaint was uh, prepared by a legal initiative, and it was uh, the first case um, where Human Rights Committee, UN Human Rights Committee, considered uh, that the condition of detention in this um, isolation center violate Article 7, 7 and 10 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And we managed to achieve the closure of this institution for repairs, which made it possible to improve uh, the material and living condition for detene detainees. And uh, now, uh, this August, uh, our organization initiated uh, the creation of the International Committee for the Investigation of Torture. Now, uh, 12 organizations have joined uh, the committee, including the World Organization Against Torture. Uh, now we are engaging uh, recording and documenting cases of torture, seek witnesses and evidence of torture, identify suspects, and uh, uh, together with uh, lawyers, prepare lawsuits and legal support for people including uh, international mechanisms. Unfortunately, to date, not a single criminal case on the facts of torture has been initiated. I'm talking about national level. And moreover, uh, our investigative committee initiates uh, criminal cases um, against the victims of torture in order to intimidate them and drop charges. And the police, the police have used uh, unnecessary and excessive force against peaceful protesters, and now hundreds of people are still in hospitals, and they have received very serious injuries, and even more, uh, several 
people died as a result of the use of excessive force. But uh, unfortunately, no criminal cases were initiated. You mentioned the lack of national mechanisms to bring perpetrators to account. What effect does investigating and reporting human rights abuses in Belarus have internationally? First of all, uh, I can tell and uh, it can be stated that now in Belarus, uh, the law doesn't work at all. So we don't see any effective mechanisms uh, in Belarus as well as any effective mechanisms, international mechanism, because, uh, for example, the state doesn't recognize the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Belarus. Uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture hasn't been invited to the country. And uh, Belarus is not a member of the Council of Europe. The four uh, mechanisms of uh, European court are not, uh, not, not available for us. And um, talking about uh, the law, I can show you one example. Uh, last week, uh, the head of the Catholic Church, who is a citizen of Belarus, was not allowed to enter the country. So now he is in Poland, and uh, this is uh, a gross violation of national law and international law. Members of the Coordination Council uh, aim to facilitate the transfer of power and uh, to, to have some kind of negotiation with the uh, current uh, government are constantly subjected to repression. First of all, on the fact of the creation of the council, a criminal case was opened for allegedly an attempt to seize power. And uh, now some board members detained. Some members uh, were forced to leave the country. And uh, Lukashenko made it clear that he refuses to negotiate with the coordination council, as well as uh, with people. So we believe that... Um, if Lukashenko remains in power, a significant part of the people, especially the most economically active, including IT sector, will simply leave the country. And if uh, he remains in power, there will be a new wave of repressions, uh, violence, and uh, nobody will investigate uh, the crimes committed against peaceful citizens and uh, the perpetrators will not be punished. Are you satisfied with the international response so far? And what more do you feel the international community can do? I ask this because Lukashenko often, of course, tries to present the uprising against him as directed from abroad, from Poland, from Lithuania, whatnot. Um, so the issue of international support is quite delicate, right? It's very difficult to talk about what can the international community to do with uh, this current situation. I believe the first um, is not to interfere in the inter uh, internal affairs. I'm talking primarily about Russia because um, the whole world saw what happened in, in Ukraine several years ago. We don't want uh, this step from our neighbor. So uh, we believe that uh, we can uh, manage this situation uh, inside country. Uh, now it's very important for us um, is moral support for peaceful protests and uh, international condemnation of the crimes committed by representatives of the state. Uh, it's, first of all, systemic torture, uh, which can be qualified as crimes against humanity. Alex, finishing off with you, uh, how would you comment on the reaction of the international community so far? And what are some of the steps that you feel should be taken going forward? The international community has reacted quite fast and decisively to the post-election developments in Belarus. Uh, the European Union in particular took a clear position by not accepting the election results and announcing sanctions against those responsible for the falsification of the vote and for the violent crackdown that followed it. However, the EU needs to continue to keep pressure on the authorities and really stick to its principles and demands while showing solidarity with peaceful protesters. The EU also needs to put money where its mouth is and uh, while cutting funds that can be misused by the authorities, increase financial support to independent the civil society. International NGOs also have a role to play in this, of course, by keeping the attention high and calling on the international community to hold the uh, authorities accountable. International human rights mechanisms are particularly important when it comes to monitoring and reporting about human rights violations on the ground and also in view to, of the need to pursue accountability in the uh, near future, hopefully. In this context, the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council 
should definitely bring the situation in Belarus at the forefront of its work by, uh, for example, holding an urgent debate and adopt a resolution where it could uh, and should mandate the High Commission for Human Rights to monitor the situation in Belarus. That would send a clear sign, a clear signal about how seriously the international community takes the current situation. In a similar way, uh, members of member states of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, should trigger the so-called Moscow mechanism in order to establish an ad hoc mission of independent experts, which would then address the human rights situation in Belarus and come up with a report for member states of the OSCE. So all in all, it's really now more important than ever that the international community shows its support, its solidarity with peaceful protesters and with the Belarusian people in general. And at the same time, it also needs to use all possible channels and tools to condemn the abuses of the authorities and really commit to hold them accountable for these abuses. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Victoria. We wish you all the best and will continue to closely monitor developments over the coming weeks and months. For more information about our work in Belarus and the general human rights situation, please follow our website and social media channels. Bye now.